It's three in the morning. Crickets singing their chorus. Frogs croaking in a nearby wallow. And then there's a sliver of a crescent moon. And Tari finds a shallow in the pasture in a corner. Away from all the other mares under a a tall willow oak tree. The branches reach out around her, almost giving her protection and welcoming her. And in the distance, she can hear coyotes and she knows she needs to be quiet. Her insides are painful. The contractions do bother her, but she's stoic. She's quiet. Little grunts. She knows she has to be quiet for her own safety, but also that of her impending foal. As she scrapes the ground and tries to nip at her sides because they are so painful her water breaks and she feels another contraction as her sides squeeze tight to push that full through the birth canal and she finally lays down and as she labors through for the next 15-20 minutes she breathes deeply and sighs But again, quietly. And the contractions keep increasing in intensity and intensity and intensity. Her hind legs straining with the efforts of getting that foal out of her. Finally, with one final push, whoosh, and out she comes. Prairie Rose, whose first breaths are labored But quickly, she gets sternal on her chest, her eyes bright, welcome to the the new world, and she whinnies. And Tari, who'd been on her side, sits back up, reaches back with her nose, and gives a soft whinny back. And secretary is being led, he is numbering... The horse... And the horses are the best thing in the world, isn't it? So I suppose one's always, I've always loved them, really, ever since I was a little girl. Everybody's in line, and they're off. The secretary of the way very well has good position. The love. Oh, I never thought owning a horse could mean so much to me. And secretary not taking the lead. The madness. What kind of a horse is that? I've never seen a horse like that before. Lightning now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Their story. Mustang is more involved in the, in the early development of this breed than I thought they were, but they were. Welcome to Mad About Horses. Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Mortensen. I've been equine educator, scientist, and researcher for over 20 years, and uh, equine reproductive physiologist. And in this episode of Mad About Horses, we're going to talk about the most exciting part, I believe, in the horse industry. This is the one I've argued with my colleagues for decades that is the most exciting part of doing research in, in equids. And that's reproduction. And, and that's the whole process of combining the largest cell in the body, which we call the oocyte, then the smallest cell produced by the body, which we call the sperm cell, and they come together and fuse. And then within 11 months, you have this gorgeous young horse welcomed to the world. And that entire process in how these babies are made and just the entire thing has always blown me away. And it is something that I've studied hard for in my career and focused my research on because it is a big part of the horse industry. It is breeding horses, improving horses, understanding it, and and making it a process where we don't lose as many horses as, say, we used to back in the day. Now, I opened with Tari giving birth to Prairie Rose in her pasture. And in this episode, I'm going to talk about why that isn't ideal. You really don't want our mares to give birth out on pasture without us observing them. Now, it does happen. Periodically, we don't catch the signs or a mare foals early. 
and they do give birth out on pasture, but you are putting that foal and mare at risk if there's any issues or problems. And we're going to talk about that today, what those issues are, why they arise, and what you can do. But if you imagine the horses out in the wild, you know, the wild horses in the west of America, or the Shavalsky's horses or Przewalski horses out on the plains of Asia, the wild horses of, of Australia. Those mares are finding those little quiet spots to sit down, isolate themselves away from the herd to give birth, and they do it so quietly. They are stoic. That is one of those things that just always amazes me about these mares is how quiet they are. Just to kind of lay out this episode, we left the mare pregnant. We're going to talk about that process of pregnancy through the horse to the birth of the foal, and then what those foals' first minutes, hours, and then days are like for it. How do we go from these little simple cells to this multicellular organism that becomes a Samson, the giant shire horse that stood over 21 hands, 3,300 pounds or 1,500 kilograms, massive horse. He too started as just a tiny little cell uh, that uh, a couple hundred years ago developed into this monster of a horse. So we're going to talk about that, the birthing process, parturition or leading up to parturition, signs to look for in the mare, and then the foal. And it's just, again, fascinating how that happens throughout the year. So in the last episode, we left Tari pregnant. She was heavily pregnant, and there's changes going on in her body leading up to parturition. The biology is driving her behavior. Our biology drives our behavior. We just don't know it. Same thing with with these horses. They are a lot more complex than we give them credit for, right? Like we would say, quote, instinct, unquote, right? It's not. It is. It's biology. And biology is driving their behavior. So most mares are going to want to give birth away from the herd, quietly find somewhere safe where they can lay down, not worried about being preyed upon, or that foal getting snatched right away. And then once the foal is ready to go, which happens within a few hours, that's where at the end of this podcast we're going to talk about how incredibly fast these foals are ready to to get up and run with the herd. It's for survival. And so a lot of evolution over the 50 million years has drove horses to this behavior. But the ones that are, are quiet, like I said, stoic, that aren't making a lot of noise, they're not drawing a lot of attention to themselves. There is some whinnying and nickering, which is the cutest thing on earth after giving birth, but they're still relatively quiet, mom and full bond. And then within a few hours, they're up moving around. And then within a few days, that foal is keeping up with the herd as it runs away, say from wolves or other predators out on the plains of Asia and North America before they were domesticated. As I mentioned in the last podcast, most of this foal growth is going in the last three months of gestation. So horses pregnancy is 11 months. So month eight, nine, 10, going into month 11, you see this dramatic growth in the foal. Now at birth, that foal is going to be about 10% of the mare's weight. So let's say if Tari weighed 1,100 pounds or 500 kilograms, that foal should roughly be about 110 pounds at birth or 50 kilograms. Tari herself is going to put on a little bit more weight because you have the placenta, which has weight, and then you have fluid, which develops in the amnion that bathes the fetus as it grows. So Tari, if she's 1,100 pounds, at the end of pregnancy, she's going to put on about 15% more weight. So she's going to be 1,230 up to 1,250 pounds during pregnancy. Then after she gives birth, obviously, she's going to lose that weight with the foal, which is they're big. And that's the thing that makes it just so exciting and fascinating is when you see a heavily pregnant mare and then within a couple hours or depends on when you catch her, there's this foal with all these legs 
is they're so gangly, but they have such long legs. And you're like, that was inside her. It's such an amazing experience. And if you have not ever seen a mare give birth, try, try to volunteer somewhere or help a friend. Do full watch. Watch these mares give birth. It is just one of those fascinating experiences that you're just like, wow. And it gives you just, a, again, that deeper appreciation for these horses and what they do. It is just, it's, it's just an incredible, incredible thing. That's why I get so excited about it. And that's why, I, you know, I study it and, and talk about it like in this podcast. So leading up to parturition or Tari's water breaking and then her giving birth, what is happening? What is driving her to go, hmm, something feels different inside me. Hmm, ooh, okay, there's some pain. There's some contractions, okay. Or even go back a couple of weeks before she gives birth, before she even goes into labor. What is going on through not only her brain, but what is going on through her body? And what starts a lot of this is fetal stress. When I say fetal stress, it's not to alarm you. It is a natural biological process that is going on. The fetus does get a tad stressed in there that starts to trigger some hormonal changes that is going to lead to parturition. And what happens is, as Prairie Rose gets bigger and bigger inside Tari's uterus, stretches out that one uterine horn that she grows in and in the uterine body, she starts to run out of room. And Tari, as much blood as she's pumping to her placenta that's passed on to Prairie Rose, there's only so much oxygen and nutrients she can give that fetus. It's got a carrying capacity, right? So what happens is Prairie Rose is getting a little less oxygen and a little less nutrients as she's getting so big and she starts to get stressed. And so she starts releasing stress hormones that are then picked up by Tari. And so it starts to convert certain hormones to prepare Tari's body. And this is, again, why biology is so incredible and fun to study. It's all a biological process. Those hormones start to change. So progesterone starts to change to estradiol, to estrogen. And estrogen starts to loosen up the cervix. Estrogen also starts to cause some uterine contractions. And then there's another hormone called relaxin that does what it says. It relaxes the mare's connective tissue. And if you can imagine the birth canal is through the hips of the mare, she has to pass this 110-pound, 120-pound foal through that birth canal. And her hips have to stretch. To, to let that happen. And so this hormone called relaxin starts relaxing those joints, other tissues, so they can stretch to pass this full through the birth canal. It is one of the most fun things. And, and I used to teach this to my students to test the tension strength of a horse's tail as she's led up to parturition. One of the things we teach and we want to look at when we're seeing if a mare is getting ready to give birth is just check her tail strength and tail tension. So if you go to any horse, go to your horse today when you're grooming them and just try to raise their tail a little bit. They're going to fight you a little bit. They have muscular control. There's some tension there and they're not going to just let you readily you know, move it around. With this hormone relaxin, as they get closer and closer to parturition, that tail is like a rubber hose. And you got to be careful. You don't want to break her tail, obviously. So do this with caution, but lift that tail up a little bit and you'll realize there's, there's no fighting. There's no tension. It's rubbery. And that's relaxing. Relaxing is, is getting her body ready to pass this full. So there is a lot of biological signaling going on to tell Tari, hey, your baby's coming. So let's get ready. And then with management, 
we're able to recognize those cues and then we're going to pull them into full installs or paddocks or an area where we can watch them, which we call full watch, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, why that's so important. Now, the old saying goes, and I learned this early on in my career, is when it comes to parturition or giving birth, the fold determines the day, the mare determines the hour. We know the foal is stressed, which is triggering these hormonal changes. It's going to get to the point where the mare's physically ready to pass the foal, but the time's not right. Let's put ourselves in Tari's hooves. Again, we'll, we'll be the wild horses out in the American West. You've got predators like mountain lions. You've got predators like bears. There are wolves. So you had all these predators wanting an easy meal. And what's easier than a mare laying down trying to pass a foal, or if that mare could get up and get away, there's a foal right there. That, that's a free, easy meal for a predator. So the horses that over time were able to give birth when it's a lot harder for predators to see and find them. And then things like smell and sound. So mares like to go and find little wallows or places where they're kind of away from the wind, like under trees or in bushes. And that's why they're so stoic and quiet because they don't want to alert any predators out there. So that's where it comes where the mare can kind of, we kind of described it as clenching down on her uterus. Like, nope, not yet. We're going to, we're going to go later tonight. We're going to go later tonight. Baby's coming today, but we're going to wait until night. And the data shows that. In a wonderful study by uh, Pete McHugh and, and Ferris that was published in the Equine Veterinary Journal a little over 10 years ago, and it was parturition, dystocia, and full survival. And this was a study of on 1,047 births, very, very large data set. Used to say 70% of all mares will give birth at night because they just can clench down, wait until the time's right. Now, domestication, we haven't selected mares for that. So over time, that's probably lessened. But from their study, 73% of the mares gave birth between 8 o'clock at night and 6 in the morning. So the data shows that that most of them are wanting to give birth during the hours of darkness. Now, if you looked at the data, most of that is falling around midnight. Very few mares gave birth during the day. From this study, only 134 of the, the thousand, so 13.4% that they observed were born during daylight hours. So most of the mares are, are giving birth at night. And that's what happens when you do this. And I've, I have fooled out hundreds of mares. They're always giving birth at night. And it makes sense because it's safety for her and safety for the foal. And that leads into long nights during full watch. Now today we have cameras in the stalls and we have other technologies to aid us to let us know when a mare's water breaks or we can be there to watch because we, uh, we wanna make sure the foal's delivered safely. Now, how do we know when to bring them in to a foaling stall or into a paddock or bring them up out of pasture at night? There are a lot of signs that we look at in the mare that clues us in. And if you want to read more on this, there's a really good article at madbarn.com. You can just go to the Learn tab, 11 Signs of Foaling in Horses, Preparation for Labor. But some of the things that we look at, I talked about the tail change. That tail gets rubbery. That is a sign that she's getting close. Everything's relaxing. Now, her udder is going to fill out. Now, mares, if you're not aware, have two udders, and they're in the hind end of the horse. They're like a cow. So we, we imagine we have cows, two big udders in the back. The mare has two udders, each with a nipple or teat, and that is going to fill out as she gets closer. So we call it bagging up. Is the mare bagging up? Is her hind end starting to loosen up? And what's her behavior like? Now, we see these changes the couple weeks leading up to parturition, and then within one to two days, these are when you're really clued in. Now, I'm going to preface all of this and say this can happen rapidly in some horses within a day or two because you do have those surprise bursts. You wake up in the morning, you go out to pasture, and you have a mare in a foal, and you're like, what the heck? 
she gave birth in the night and we were watching her and, and doing all of our tests. And this can happen really rapidly. But for the majority of horses, you see this happen over a period of a couple of weeks up to a couple of days. And then you're really, typically what happens is you're on full watch all night and she doesn't give birth. And so you put her out in a small pasture or paddock with some hay and watch her all day. And then you put her back in the night and you watch her again, sleepless nights. And I'm sure some people are laughing as they're listening to this podcast going, yep, 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 happened to me. And it's like five days later, she finally gives birth because she was showing all the signs. But again, that foal just wasn't quite ready. And that does happen. But really within one to two days, that hind end is super relaxed. That's where that tail is really rubbery. Her vulva is going to get longer. Get preparing again hormonal changes estrogen's higher her abdomen is normally distended to a side and that's usually the side the foal is developing on we describe it as like her belly drops and it becomes more symmetrical when looking the, from the mare from behind and you look at a pregnant mare you can generally see one side's bulging out more than the other and that's the side, because remember, the mare has two uterine horns. That's the side the foal's developing on. As she gets closer to parturition, that becomes more symmetrical because that foal is moving, is getting ready, is being nudged to get into the position to go in the, in the birth canal properly. So you should see like her belly drop, and then that becomes more symmetrical. Big signs that we look for is her udder and teats. And there's this phenomenon called waxing of the teats or little beads of colostrum, which is the first milk the mare produces at the tip of the teats. And you'll see this in some extreme examples, milk will be streaming, which is a, that's a whole other podcast again with uh, colostrum. But the mare only produces so much colostrum that she needs to give the full. But you do see a little dripping or just a little bit of that like drawing at, at, the, at the tip. And that's a, that's a clear sign that she's getting close. Now, when we see those signs, you want to observe your mare and you want to watch her behavior. And then at night, like I said, you want to bring her up to where you can quietly observe her and check on her every hour or if she's getting really close every 30 minutes. When we do talk about parturition and mares and helping mares, always say resist the temptation to rush in there. You want to do a little bit just to make sure things are progressing normally, but you mostly want to be hands off because the mares do this and they do it well. I have been through so many births with horses and very rarely did I need to intervene. It, it, it's one out of 10 or even like 5%. So five out of a hundred really is where you get into trouble and, and you might need to be there. But again, that one out of 10 is why we're watching them because if they run into trouble, it can result in the death of the foal or both the death of the foal and the death of the mare, which is just devastating. Again, I've seen that happen and it's heart wrenching, absolutely heart wrenching. So Resist the temptation to help and pull and all of those things, but be ready to if you need to. Now, when we look at the statistics based on that, that Peter McHugh, Dr. McHugh, wonderful reproductive physiologist, I've got to meet him a few times, have dinners and, and talk about his research. And in this study, when we looked at, again, over a thousand mares, 12 of the mares gave birth at less than 320 days. Because remember, we, we talked about the average 330, 340-ish days. Very few give birth early. I've seen one that early. Full was fine. It was just that mare. She always gave birth early, and this one was three weeks early. But of the 12, 8% or one of them died. It was still birth. The mare carried it through pregnancy. Something went wrong. Could have gotten an infection. Full died. But 11 out of the 12 went on to deliver a normal birth. Out of the 988 that gave birth between 320 and 360 days, only 1.3% gave birth to stillbirth. Most went on to give birth to healthy foals. 
The ones that went longer than 360 days, and this was 41 over the, out of the over 1,000 births that they observed, 7.3% uh, resulted in stillbirth. So if it's abnormal lengths, it looked like a little bit higher risk of, of a stillbirth, but most went on to give birth to, to normal foals. So, so that data looks good. Now, when you looked at full survival, some of the things that cause foals to pass away or have a, a hard labor for the mare, hard delivery, and that, that leads to the mortality statistics. Mares that gave birth earlier than 320 days, 8% of the foals died. In that normal 320 to 360 range, only 3.6%. That's about 35 to 36 foals died after birth. And that happens with dystocias. And then greater than 360, that bumped up out of the 41, 4.8%. So that's two or three that uh, passed away. And what causes that, a lot of it is what we call dystocias. And that is mispresentation, malpresentation of the foal. The foal is coming out breech. There's one leg back, its head's twisted back. Uh, talk a little bit about that here uh, coming up in stage two of labor when you would look for that. That is why, again, that to, to reiterate, that is why we want to watch these mares to avoid those situations. But even then, and these were horses in a vet hospital under supervision getting help, even then the foals could pass away. And and, and I've seen it a few times. And again, it, it's, it's just heart-wrenching. But if we go to Prairie Rose, who did make it, and Tari. She wasn't out in pasture. Tari was in a foaling stall in Texas. There's three stages of labor. And in stage one, tricky, you've got to catch it. This is the one where you've got to have a trained eye or know what you're looking for to see, yep, she's in labor. Because horses hide pain so well. I know many of you listening no it's hard to diagnose lameness it's hard to know if your horse is unwell sometimes because they do hide pain very very well to survive so they don't show it to a predator out in the wild and one of the the easiest ways to see if your mare is going to labor is i described it like colic colic is a critical topic that we're going to have a podcast on very soon because it is the number one killer of horses under the age of 20. It is abdominal pain. It is because of the way we manage them, how we feed them in many situations, other things in their lives that causes them abdominal pain that can lead to death. And I say this, stage one of labor is like colic, but mares can colic before giving birth. And I had a mare colic two days before she gave birth. So it can happen. <laughs> uh, that was uh, one of the worst cases is just you thought she was going into labor, bring her up, but she actually was colicking. And under veterinary care, and, and, and she survived and the baby survived two days later, fine. But it, it's the horse is in distress, is sweaty. She's nipping at her side. So her tuft of hair along her belly will be lifted up where she's been nipping because there's pain there. The uterus is contracting, so it's incredibly painful. And she's restless, and she might lay down and get up, and she pees every now and then. She poops a little bit. She's sweaty. Her girth, her flanks, her neck, all of those signs is like, okay, the mare's in labor. Now we want to watch her much more closely. Instead of checking on her every hour, we're going to quietly stand out the stall, sit on a chair, and just listen until her water breaks. When her water breaks, that's the end of stage one of labor. Not to be confused with urination, I was woken up at three in the morning because my students were on full watch. I'd got my coffee ready, threw on my boots, jumped in my truck, sipping my coffee halfway to the barn. Students called back and said, sorry, Chris, she was urinating. True story. <laughs> Just turned around, went home, and tried to get some sleep before I had to rush off the class. Life of a grad student. So that does happen. And then 
another time, I remember after class, students were checking horses. Dr. Mortensen, can you look at this horse for me? Walked up, looked at the mare, did an assessment, dripping milk. I said, this mare is definitely going to fold tonight. Go home, get your sleeping bags. You're on full watch. Jumped in my truck. I was halfway down the road, got a phone call. Her water broke. And this was like five o'clock in the afternoon, in the evening. Turned my truck around, went back, wham, bam, full out, did all the full checks. I was home by nine o'clock. That was a great night because instead of three in the morning to six, seven in the morning, I was there from five to about eight thirty, nine o'clock. Was able to get dinner on the way home and, and get a good night's sleep. Very unique though. That was not typical. That was a mare that couldn't clench down, a mare that couldn't fight the urge to give birth, you know, because they want to give them at night. Because my typical nights of those last two stories, majority of my experience was students out on full watch, sleeping at the barn. I'd get a call from midnight to four in the morning, somewhere in there when a mare was about to give birth. And then get there. And by the time I got to the barn, it would take me 15, 20 minutes. The baby was on the ground. So stage two of labor goes really quickly. Within 20 minutes, that baby should be out of the mare. Talk about a superpower. Their water breaks and that baby's out quick. Where in humans, that baby might not be out for two days after a mom's water breaks. And that's rare, but that does happen. And it goes back to... Horses that were able to have their babies quietly, quickly, safely are the ones that survived. And they passed on those genetics. The wolves couldn't find them or catch them or the lions or all the other predators. Now, going back to Dr. McHugh's study, the average length of stage two labor in all those horses they, they looked at was 16.7 minutes. That was quick. 71 or 72 percent of the horses, so 720 of the the 1,005 that they have in their data set, was born in less than 20 minutes. When stage two went greater than 40 minutes, that's where you saw a lot of full mortality. Which again, I'm going to talk about here in a second because it is the hard. That's the hard part of it. But most of it is that full is out, and then. Again, one of those moments when you think back of working with horses and it just grin to grin, smile from ear to ear is when that mare and foal bond for the first time. It is one of those moments in my career again and again and again, every time I see it, every time I hear it, it makes my heart sing. Bottom line is that full mare bonding that begins right away. Now, how do we get there to make sure that full gets out safely? This is where you want a little bit of intervention. When her water breaks, you want to check the foal's position. You want to make sure that that foal is in the proper orientation to be able to be pushed out of the mare's birth canal, out of her uterus, into the world. Now, proper position is both legs and nose presented at the mare's vulva. When that mare is either laying down, or you can see it visually, but probably laying down, because at first you're not going to be able to see, you know, probably that nose. You want to put on some gloves and go lift her tail. Be, do it carefully, obviously, but most mares during labor are pretty focused on that, uh, Usually it's a pretty safe situation and you should feel both hooves with their feet pointed down and the nose right above it. Now, if you're driving, you can't do this, but you can maybe do it is if you hold your arms out, not straight like a mummy. And I'll, and I'll talk about that shoulder lock position here in a second, because I did experience that with, with a mare. But your arms kind of up, like, you know how people prance around and plays like they're a horse or, I don't know why, a reindeer on a play, you know, the, the, your arms are crooked back. Okay, do that. Your arms are crooked back, but your left arm is a little bit like a hand length in front of your right. If you do that, 
look what your shoulders do. Okay, you can do the mummy position, which is arms straight out, and your shoulders are square. But when you crook your arms, like you're holding them out, like you're prancing around a stage, pretending to be a horse, and you push that left arm just a little bit forward of your right, you notice your shoulders shift. And that is what you should see. You should see that left leg followed by that right leg, followed by a nose resting right on top. The foal's muzzle should be resting right on top of those legs. That is proper position. And most horses are going to be there. Now, you might see just two little hooves sticking out. And that's why you want to wear a glove. You want to just check the mare's vulva, open it up a little bit, and the nose and nostril should be right there. My most difficult personally was I had a foal in shoulder lock position, like a mummy. And this mare was struggling, 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 standing up, getting down, standing up, getting down, because the mare's like trying to help that foal get in proper position because the mare knew something wasn't quite right. And then when she was down, I was trying to pull. Now, again, this is probably a whole nother podcast talking about the entire foaling process, insides and outs. But as an overview, if you're ever pulling a foal, is you want to grip them above their fetlock joint. And when the mare contracts, you'll see it. Her legs will tighten and you'll see the contractions in her abdomen. You pull a little bit out, but down because the foal is coming out with a curvature of its spine. So as that mare is pushing, that foal should be dropping towards the mare's hocks. So you pull out and down when she contracts. When she stops, you stop. You don't want to hurt her or the foal. And I was doing this with the mare and the foal was not coming and it was in a shoulder lock position tight in her birth canal. So I had to realign and push back that right leg of the foal to get that shoulder to shift. Finally, me and a student, and I had the, the trailer ready. I said, if we can't get it this time, we're going to put the mare in the trailer and get over to the vet hospital immediately. Uh, thankfully, at Texas A&M, the vet hospital was just across the campus. So I was very fortunate if we ran into more problems. But finally, we pulled, had my foot against the, the rump of the mare and pop. I felt the hips like give way. And out came this monster foal. She must have weighed like 140 pounds, 60 something kilograms. She was massive. Thankfully, we got the foal out. Everything was fine. Mare was fine. Foal was fine. That for me was just the, the worst dystocia I had to experience. But if you ever have any issues, you always speak with your veterinarian. If you're ever concerned, time is of the essence. You want to call your veterinarian immediately, and, and, and your horse vets know this. This is what they do during breeding season, right? They're running around doing calls, emergency calls, and dystocias and things like that. If you want to learn more, there's a, there's a really good article, madbarn.com. Go learn tab, dystocia in horses, signs, causes, and treatments of foaling difficulties. Uh, one of our veterinarians wrote that article. Uh, you could read about that. And then the other thing you want to look for is not position, but... If you ever see a red bag, and again, this is my, my most difficult story uh, surrounding foaling, was a red bag birth. And what a red bag birth is, the mare's water doesn't break per se, but her entire placenta separates prematurely from her uterus. And you have the Corian Allen toy, which is the outer layer of the placenta. And then inside that is the amnion, amniotic layer, and then the, the full inside that. What happens in these situations, and, and they are very rare, but everything separates inside the mare. And so there is no placental attachment to mom. And the danger is that full inside that placenta is not getting any oxygen to its brain. And it typically is born brain dead. So if you see just a red bag presentation, you want to slice that placenta open and get that full out immediately. And the story that I was in California and 
it was a hackney mare who was a very flighty and she exhibited all the signs of labor. She was out in pasture and we tried to get her up. Me, uh, my mentor, a couple other students, and she was just running circles around us. She'd lay down for a minute. We'd get close to her. She'd jump back up. And the whole time we saw this red bag. By the time we got the colt out of her, by she finally laid down and, and surrendered, it was brain dead. And it, its ears were to the side. We call them dummy foals. And it had to be euthanized the next day. Beautiful paint coat pattern colt. I remember them. And just had enough to breathe, wouldn't nurse, wouldn't stand, was just there up sternal, meaning on its chest. And, and, and it was heartbreaking. It was an absolutely heartbreaking story that I lived through and early, early in my career. It was just like, wow. And there was nothing we can do. Now, this was two decades ago. We do have research now where we give them oxygen. There has been a lot of great research done in vet hospitals throughout the world looking at ways to assist these foals and they have been able to come back and get brain function again. So there, there is that out there and, and maybe that's something we talk about a different day in research. But again, you see a red bag, get that foal out quickly. When we go back to Prairie Rose, everything proceeds normally. She's out on the ground. She should struggle immediately. Those first few breaths of that foal. Again, this is a point where you maybe want to go in and we call it stripping the nose. If there's any debris, but you can go and just use your two fingers and just kind of wipe down the nostrils because those first few breaths are, are difficult for the foal, but they should be breathing normally relatively quickly. They're all legs and they should whinny a little bit, neigh and mom. Oh, it's the best. This is the best. She just, a lot of times either they'll stand up and start licking the foal and nuzzle the foal, or if they're really tired, long labor, they'll reach back with their noses and, and nuzzle the foal and neigh and, and nicker. And it's just, it, it's just magic. It is magic. It is one of those things everybody should experience. Now this enters stage three. This is passage of the placenta. Baby's out on the ground. We've got to get that placenta out of the uterus. Can take up to three hours. A lot of what we recommend is to tie up the placenta. So get some rope or anything around there, string, tie up that placenta into a ball, hangs around her hawks, and that will help pass that placenta. It puts a little bit of weight on there. She's still experiencing contractions, but 90% of the mares should pass their placentas, no problem. If it goes beyond three hours, call your veterinarian. To retain placenta, it could put the mare's life in danger if she got a bad uterine infection. Take it seriously, but the vet will come out and can either flush the mare, maybe give her some oxytocin treatment. Again, something you're going to deal with if you're around the breeding shed enough or, or foaling shed. But there is a lot of research out there how to deal with retained placenta or fetal membranes. we got to get that out because if it's left in there, it, it gets necrotic, it dies, and it will poison the mare. Okay, but most mares, it passes. And then your day isn't over, your morning, your night. You're not ready to go home yet. The baby's out on the ground. Great. Mom and baby are, are talking. Mom's licking the baby. Placenta comes out, great, get it out, check it, check to make sure there's no remnants inside mare. But your, your day's not over or your day's not even begun because you've got to make sure the baby can stand and nurse. And so Prairie Rose, thankfully, was one of the, the champions. She was quick, but I've had some foals that took hours to stand and nurse. They're just a little bit slower starting life. But most foals should try to start standing within 30 minutes. And then after two hours, they should be able to stand unassisted. Then you want to make sure they nurse within the first three to four hours. Anybody who has been around foals, you will watch them nurse everything but her udder. Mom will help. Mom is incredible. She'll maneuver where her udders are right in front of the foal's face. 
She will encourage them with her nose, and that foal will stumble around and nurse her shoulder or chew on her tail or hang out at her hocks. But you should not leave that foal and mare until you watch that foal latch on for the first time. And that's because that foal needs mom's milk to survive. It's colostrum. It's what all mammals produce. It is the first milk. And basically what it's doing is giving that foal its immunity for its first few months of life. Again, this is a whole nother podcast, very in-depth topic. Uh, again, on Mad Barn, another great article, Colostrum for Newborn Foals. You can check it out there. But it gives that foal its immunity to this hostile world of microbes and bacteria and viruses and everything to fight off illness. We're born with no immunity. We get it from mom's milk. And that's why colostrum is so important. So we want to make sure they nurse. And then we want to make sure they poop, which we call the meconium. It's from their digestive system during gestation where they swallow some of that amniotic fluid and things and digest it. But you want to make sure that they're passing manure. So they usually will do that after nursing. And that can take upwards of six hours. Thankfully, Prairie Rose was quick and we were leaving the barn within three, four hours. She stood up, stumbled around a bunch. She nursed. We checked Tari's colostrum with a colostrometer. IgG levels were really good. And we ensured that foal got not only just the quality, had enough IgG in it, but the quickness, it, it had it within the first few hours. And it was nursing a lot. The other thing you want to do is IgG tests. Again, and I'll link these in my show notes. I will link some of these articles so they're easy for you to access. But IgG testing in foals is another good article you can read at madbarn.com. It is one thing we want to do within 24 hours. Uh, SNAP test kit readily available in the U.S. The only difficulty is you need to get a blood sample from the foal. That is not easy. That can be difficult. But once you have that blood sample, you do the SNAP test, you ensure they got enough IgG in their blood and you're not having to do a plasma transfer or something like that. That can be quite pricey to ensure that that foal has the immunity it needs to survive. And then within 24 hours, you can put them in a paddock the next day in the sunlight, bring them in at night. And then within a few days, once mare and foal are properly bonded, you can put them out with the herd. Uh, with the other mares and foals. And then this is where Tari enters that lactation cycle. But over the coming months, that mom and foal are just going to be inseparable. Prairie Rose, she's nursing off Tari every 10 minutes. Then by the end of the week, maybe every 30 minutes. By the end of the month, she's ever nursing every hour or so. She's nibbling some of mom's food, maybe in some hay, maybe in some of mom's poop. <laughs> but that's important. Prairie Rose needs those gut microbes that mom has, so eating mom's poop is normal. That's a normal behavior that they they should do, that she needs her gut microbes. And then it's that bond's going to carry on for about six months or until it's time for Prairie Rose to, to be weaned off mom and become part of a herd of yearlings. That's the whole future podcast. Oh, my goodness, those kids. Oh, oh, they're always fun, but they they just are rambunctious and, and fun to watch. But Tari's getting ready, and, and hopefully she's pregnant with her next foal, because that's the life of a broodmare. And then Prairie Rose will either follow in her mom's hoof prints, or she'll go on to be the incredible riding horse that she was destined to be. The only thing Prairie Rose needs to remember. I think we all need to remember is, is the great start we got in life thanks to our own mothers. And Prairie Rose got an excellent one off her, her incredible mother, Tari. I love talking about fooling and it brings back so many fun memories and, and some, some hard ones. I mean, some really, really hard ones that that hackney cold, like I just, that mare, we couldn't get her down. I it just, she was doing circles around us and, and we tried to bring her up and, and she just wouldn't. And we lost the foal. And, and that was a significant investment to the farm. That foal was going to sell for at least $5,000. It, it was a hackney horse, which is, is a rare breed. 
but it was the heartbreak that that was the word it wasn't the money it was the fact that we had to euthanize that baby that was a tough one thankfully most the majority of births that i did over the years i was a graduate student in texas uh, and then my time at clemson and then my time at the university of florida when i was heavily involved in folding out mares and research those mares are just incredible 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 so you know i would always suggest if you can get on full watch or have a friend or a breeding farm that you know of and if they need help it, it's just something you should experience if you love these animals and again thank you for listening your time's precious as i put this podcast together i'm trying to think what can i do to make it not just entertaining but educational so thank you and if you really enjoyed that episode if you don't mind sharing it on social media or with a friend you are going to help me grow this podcast i need your help and and that will help a lot and then if you haven't a, a quick five-star review on itunes or spotify is big but those articles i will link in the show notes there's plenty of articles on madbarn.com free education go check them out easy to read they really are they're really well done dvms phds nutrition experts all of the team putting those together day in day out social media tiktok instagram facebook linkedin x all of it look for mad barn and then you can always email me quick shout out to sue in ontario who emailed me the other day and, and we're having a nice conversation uh, via email but podcast at madbarn.com stay tuned more fun stuff coming your way and again thank you thank you for listening and thank you for caring about horses take care <laughs>